we have all of these new toys to play with, right? Inhibiting different pathways, BCL2 and PI3 kinase, BTK, um, immunotherapies, chemotherapies. What's the future hold? That's a good question. I think that the future will largely be novel combinations of drugs where we're treating patients for fixed durations, but I don't want to say fixed duration. I want to say treating patients towards depth of response with an opportunity to discontinue these combinations. I think everybody wants to stop them, these drugs, whether they're given as monotherapies or given in combination. We want to do it intelligently, not just treat and stop for everybody, but maybe based on biology, based on depth of response or the interaction between the two. I think that as we are able to combine them, and this is really the infancy of this field, that we are seeing responses where there are MRD, minimal residual disease undetectable more and more frequently. Whether or not that translates to potential cure, we don't know, and I think it's almost irresponsible to say that at this point. All we can say is that some of these drugs in combination induce deeper responses. Whether that translates into something else, it's hard to know, and I think it's wrong to translate the experience with mutated IGHV patients treated with FCR who become MRD undetectable and say the same expectation is with combination therapy. But I think that that's where we're going, and with longer-term follow-up, we'll learn whether or not that's the case. Is there any preclinical data that might help guide which combinations might be most helpful? There, there really hasn't been. There, there is certainly preclinical data, but the actual combinations that are being tested are drugs in combination that may be additive in their effect, but not necessarily clearly synergistic, but may be more based on um, you know, who owns what drug and how those could be combined. So I think there's a lot of room to go in terms of picking the right partners based on biology. I think that's a big weakness right now. Okay, and we've heard recently about uh, data coming out from our colleagues in myeloma research with uh, BCL2 inhibition. Um, how about BTK in inhibition in myeloma? Any role there? Yeah, I think they, they have been studied, although I'm not really that familiar with the data. Okay. Um, certainly hasn't changed standard of care yet. Well, let me ask you about a, 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 a late, comp not necessarily a late complication, a serious complication of CLL, and that's progression to a Richter's transformation. Mm -hmm. Um, any pearls of wisdom there? BTK inhibition alone or with chemotherapy? Does it have any roles? Immunotherapies? All being studied, um, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with whether or not a patient had a BTK inhibitor as part of their CLL therapy. You know, the, the data from several groups suggest that the median survival for Richter that evolves out of a BTK inhibitor is like somewhere between like three and nine months, three and seven months. So it's a life-threatening situation, probably the biggest unmet need in all of CLL right now. There have been combinations with targeted agents with checkpoint inhibitors, data presented at ASH, looked at ibrutinib plus nivolumab. Looked exciting, but really the activity was in the BTK-naive patients. Mm -hmm. um, Anthracycline-based chemoimmunotherapy backbones are being combined with a Cala or ibrutinib or venetoclax, and they look to be interesting, but hard to know what this, you know, the standard of care right now is still RCHOP chemotherapy for patients. Um, you know, clonally unrelated patients do okay. Clonally related patients don't do so well. I think the checkpoint inhibitors are exciting, but not by themselves. Probably in combination, we study them with a PI3K inhibitor. It also looked exciting, but still single arm trial. Um, okay, along the same line, mm -hmm. then maybe last question here on, on this. Um, we do have a lot of new agents, a lot of pathways to target, but you must be seeing patients where none of these agents are working anymore. Do you fall back on chemoimmunotherapy? Is that still a viable option? We sometimes do, but it's not studied. And so there's very little information about, you know, if you start off on a chemotherapy-free pathway, I'm just kind of calling it that, they're really all chemos, right? They're all but a targeted pathway. Um, and you've gone through, you know, let's say ibrutinib, idelalisib, venetoclax, no one knows what to do. That, we're studying that actively now. Through, we, we've developed a consortium, um, depending on the study, between 20 and 40 centers who combine their data to try to answer these questions. But that's one of the big answers is, A, how to treat venetoclax progressors who failed other therapies. B, is there a role for a BTK inhibitor in a ven failure who are BTK naive? Um, all unknown, all unstudied at this time. You know, not long ago, um, patients who have, uh, with CLL, who had high-risk disease, 17P deletion, or had progressed after one or two cycles, 
and were young and otherwise healthy, you start be you start thinking about allogeneic yeah. transplant. Is there still a role for allo transplant, and in which patients are you considering? Great it? question. Um, it's unknown, and the number of tran if you look at the data from the the, reg the transplant registries, the number of transplants done in CLL has dropped so dramatically over the last several years that they can't even answer that question. We've actually proposed that question um, as a formal study. And the, you know, the, the answers we got were that there were just not enough patients available to answer that question. Whether or not having a BTK inhibitor or one of these other drugs on board alters the outcome of the transplant is unknown. The EBMT have criteria that suggest that if you're responding to your first targeted agent, even if you have a high risk feature, you probably should not transplant. If you're on your second targeted agent, you can think about it more for those patients. So those are the kind of patients that we think about even identifying a potential donor source. But then competing with the allo transplant is the advent of cellular therapies and whether or not right. CAR T will should come before an allo transplant should they be approved for CLL and there are some registrational trials that are ongoing right now. So it's unknown. We're trying to gather that data ourselves to look at allo in the novel agent era, but it's it's not easy to do. Okay, last question, I promise. Okay. Okay. You're up for it. Mantle cell lymphoma. We are giving aggressive chemotherapy and autologous transplant, but as you said, most of these patients relapse. Any data on using BTK inhibition as a maintenance after uh, auto transplant in that disease or yeah, others? Yeah, to my knowledge, no, um, but- Do you think it makes sense? I think it may, I mean, certainly maintenance therapies and other hematologic malignancies like myeloma, for example, have been well received in our, our standard of care on some level. I think that it does make sense biologically. Whether or not it's been studied specifically as a post-transplant maintenance, I'm not aware. It's possible that it already has, and I just don't know that data. Okay. Well, I did promise that would be my last question. Thank you for letting Thanks me. Thanks for uh, having me. Well, thank you, Dr. Mato, for letting me pick your brain and for your very insightful discussion. And thank you to our audience for joining us during this targeted oncology presentation on precision medicine.